It's, uh, again, good to be home. I got it here on two wheels, even though I drive an 18-wheeler last night. I uh, really haven't slept, but it's all good because I know that God is going to do his thing. And, of course, everything that could happen would happen. Printer issues, computer issues, all of the above, but God is still good. Amen? So what we're going to do is go from what we know. Is that all right? Because one thing about it, when you know what you know, and you know that you know, nobody can take that from you. Amen? No matter what's going on, come hell or high water, you're able to bless the Lord. To passing is absent, first lady, good to see you. To all the saints, friends, members, uh, foes, if you're in the place, welcome, welcome, welcome. We're going to get right into it today. We're going to come from the book of Luke, and Luke the fifth chapter, and we're going to start at verse 4. Very short um, passage. Uh, also a very familiar passage to those of you, if you grew up in church or been around church at all, any, you're going to be familiar with this passage. We're going to be talking about our boy, Simon Peter. Amen? All right, Simon Peter. And it's up on the screen for you. Now, when he had le left speaking, he said unto Simon, lunch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. Amen? Do we have? And Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fish and their net broke. Amen? Somebody said toiled. We're going to talk about toiling today. But the subject of our text today is double down. In the book of Luke, I don't know what was going through Peter's mind when Jesus stopped him and asked him for his boat and asked him to use it so that he could preach. I don't know what was going through Peter's mind. I can imagine he was tired. He just wanted to go home, get something to eat. You know how it is after work. You want to get off. You want to put your feet up. You want to get your drink. You want to get something to eat. la di da -di, whatever you do. So I don't know. I can't imagine what was going through his mind when he gets off work and Jesus comes and says, let me use your boat. I want to preach. Push out from this shore a little bit. Nevertheless, he did that. So as he goes, as Jesus preaches and finally he gets done preaching, um, he already, he already asked him for the boat. So he got off work. This is like asking somebody asking you for overtime, and they're not going to pay you. All right? So he gets off work. Jesus asks for the boat, and he has a sermon. We don't know if Jesus was an hour preacher or he was one that had three closes. We don't know. But he got through preaching, and after he got through preaching, Jesus then told Peter to go back to work. Really? You get off work, you, ain't want, you don't want no foolishness. You get off work, you want to do your thing. He's already been held up with the first sermon. Jesus does the benediction and then tell him, get back on your boat and go back out into the deep. Peter says, now, Lord, we've been toiling all night. But nevertheless, I'll do what you ask me to do. So Peter goes back out into the beat. Now, I can only imagine that Peter, it, we, well, we can hear it in the, in the text. Peter flesh rose up for a second there. Like, you got to use your imagination. He wasn't happy about that. I wouldn't have been happy about it. So I know he wasn't happy about it. So his flesh rose up for a second. He said what he had to say. Lord, we've been toiling all night. I will go out nevertheless at your word. So I want to look at that word toiling. That dude used toiling Toiling. How many would have thought to put that word there? He had to be seriously upset to use the word toiling. Because he could have said, Lord, I done worked all night. Lord, I ain't been asleep yet. Lord, I'm tired. But the dude said, I've been toiling all night long. Now, the word toiling means hard labor, intense labor. The word toiling means uh, we've been at it for a while and we's tired, boss. That's the word toiling. Peter wasn't being rebellious or anything. He was just being honest and, honest and based on his belief and based on his experience, he didn't think that fish would be biting that time of day. 
He didn't think it was worth going out. They didn't work during the day. If the fish was biting during the day, Lord, it's like he want me to go out here. Mm, he don't know what he's talking about. If the fish was biting during the day, we would work during the day. There's a reason that we fish at night. He tells them to go back into the deep in the middle of the day. I got to know he said, no, to self. You know how we do when God tells us to do something that we can't see is possible. When God tells us to do something that we can't see our success in, we can't see that thing coming together. Peter wasn't being rude or anything. He just didn't understand based on my experience. I've been fishing for a long time. Now, you a preacher, but I'm a fisherman. I've been fishing for a long time, and I don't see this working out. He wasn't being rude. He was just stating the facts based on his experience, based on his belief, based on his limited knowledge. You're going to catch this because somebody's going to be blessed today. Based on his limited knowledge. Okay, so we can see that in his conversation. He didn't, he didn't understand what God was asking him to do. He'd been doing it a long time. And he, he, um, he had his own plan already set. You, you already have your life in motion. I'm going to do this at this age. I'm going to do this at this age. I'm going to do this, this, this. I'm going to make a few mistakes here, and I'm going to do this, this, this. And God interrupts your life and said, no, I'm going to save you. God said, um, you ain't going to like to taste alcohol no more. God said, you won't buy another joint. You were like, hey, that was you. You live to pick up your package. I need my rest. I need my relaxation. God said, uh, beep, beep, stop. God said, you're going to be celibate for the next two years. What? Lord. Because you have your life already planned. But then here comes God and interrupts you, and you're talking to him like, you don't know what you're talking about, Lord. I'll never not do that. I always got to go there. Them are my friends for life. We ride or die. Yeah. And God said, all right. And sometimes we don't want to do what God says right away, and he has a way of getting our attention. But nevertheless, Peter, Peter knew Okay, so Peter knew of God. This is the other thing. Peter knew of God because God, uh, Jesus had healed his mother-in-law. He already had an experience with Jesus. I believe that's why he went to the nevertheless. Because had that ever been another average rabbi, I believe they would have got the business. I, I'm just talking about for me, I know. They would have got, who are you telling? I'm a fisherman, you're a preacher. Stand up on that rock, proclaim your message, I'm going home, and go to bed. I got to go to work tonight. But he had a history with Jesus, but he still, even having that history, second-guessed what Jesus wanted him to do. When Jesus enters your life and when God has a plan for your life, the Bible tells us that old things are washed away. And behold, we have a whole new standard, a whole new mindset. All things, old things are passed away. Jesus calls Peter to a new occupation. He was a good fisherman of the sea, but Jesus called him to be fisherman of men. Simon Peter knows enough to check his attitude and say, nevertheless, if you say so. What does double down mean? I told you we were going to talk about doubling down. Peter doubled down. Now, the word double down um, is defined as to put forth the additional effort or risk in a situation or argument. So you're going to put forth an additional er effort or you're going to take a risk in a situation or argument. Double down means to strengthen one's commitment to a particular strategy. Um, you going to decide to take a different course of action. Typically, if that action is potentially a risk, you're going to commit to a strategy or a position. Stay with me, because some of y'all are going, what is all that? In blackjack, when you get your hand, you look at your cards. You decide whether or not you want to double down. 
either you going the dealer's gonna give you another card and you're gonna go on and play, or you're gonna double down, okay? Doubling down means you're gonna take a risk. I got these cards and they looking pretty good. Do I take the risk or do I play the hand that I got? Peter doubled down. He took a risk. You can't play it safe and walk in faith. It doesn't work that way. If you're going to walk in faith, it's always going to be a risk. You need to double down. You can't play it safe and know that you got money in the bank and say, God has blessed me. It's going to work out. And you know you can pay the bill. That ain't faith, baby. You know you're getting a check on Friday. That ain't faith. When you ain't got no money in the bank, you know your check from Friday is already spent because all that's on automatic draft. Your account is already negative. So not only you ain't going to see that check, you're going to get them fees for the checks that's coming through. And you saying God's going to work it out. That's faith, baby. And you continue to go to work, smile, skipping along. That's faith. Not when you know what's going on, what's going to happen. So. Peter decided to double down. He didn't know what was going to happen. He said, nevertheless, Lord. Um, God gave, sometimes God gives us a glimpse of where we're going, a sense of who we're going to be. He gives us a little bit of a vision of our life. But he needs you to see your hand, and you have to make the decision, just like in Blackjack. You decide if you're going to double down. You have a hand in front of you. You have one of three options. Now, you can play it straight, go with what you have, hope your, your, hope your uh, opponent doesn't overtake you. That's the enemy, for those that don't know. Or you can fold. Hey, throw in the towel. I'm just out of the game. Just watch everybody else progress. Or you can double down. You can take the risk, run the, way, run the race. You can fight with all you got. You can put your cards on the table and say, let's do this. Whatever comes, comes, but we're going to play this to the end. When you double down, you hold nothing back. You give it your all. You put your cards that you have in a position that they can win to the best of your ability. You take a chance. One definition says that you maximize the potential yield. In life, I came to tell you today, as children of the Most High God, it's time to double down. The world does not care anything about you burning sage because you want to cover your house from demons. The world doesn't care anything. The enemy doesn't care anything about you getting your palm read and Madam Lucy saying that you're going to be married with five healthy kids, a new house, and a car. Demons don't worry about that. You got to double down in the Holy Spirit. You got to double down in prayer. You got to double down in the Word of God. You got to double down in affirmations. You have got to double down in things that you have not been doing normally. What you've been doing is not enough to carry you where you got to go. What you have been doing is not enough to sustain you for what's going on in the world. You got to double down in the things of God, new things. Peter had never fished during the day. The word of God said not only did he get so many fish, he had to call others over to help him receive the load because he doubled down in what Jesus had to say. He took a chance on Jesus. He took a chance on the word of God. He didn't sleep in Sunday morning because he worked Saturday night. He did not sow or tithe. He used his boat as a, a form of tithing. He had just got off work. What you mean you want to use my boat and preach? What you mean you want my last $10? If you hadn't tied that week, it's, that was your first $10. It wasn't the last. You were supposed to give a tenth before you got to your last. But if you don't double down, 
I am a witness. Take it from me. And I know you've heard Bishop tell the testimony of the other two churches, <laughs> two tornadoes. But I'm a witness. When you tithe, even if the, if the light bill is already due, the light bill is already a notice, and you short, that short ain't going to get your lights turned on. They want their money, and they want all of it. You might as well give God his 10% and trust him to work it out. Trust him to help you get favor in making an arrangement. I was talking to a friend of mine just the other day. Yesterday, on my way in, she called me. She had both of her hands done for copper tunnels. She has a 6-year-old and a 12-year-old. Her and her spouse is separated, and he's not very cooperative. Her mother has mental issues. Her sister lives about 45 minutes from her, and her brother lives in the next in the same state, but the next county over. She got both of her wrists done. There's not much she can do. Her 12-year-old's trying to help her, but you know 12-year-olds, because she's done everything for them. This is the first time she's been, you know, incapacitated. And she feels like, why I got to do this? You don't want to open a bottle of water for the person that you've known all your life? For the one person that's been constant in your life from day one? I told her, it's you, your mom, and your sister. You're the oldest. You got to step up and you got to step up and help out. It's your responsibility. You're your mom's legacy. It's nobody before you. It's you. And you help your mom. I said, and I asked her, who's been constant in your life? Who's been constant in your life from day one? She said, mommy. Who makes it happen when can't nothing else happen? When there's no food in the house? Who's, made, who, who's not eating and you eat? Mommy. You come home with a situation with a little boy on the bus. Who goes to the school to make sure that that's right because she don't want you to feel threatened? Not that nothing happened. She don't want you to feel threatened. And you telling me you can't open 12 bottles of water and sit them pills on the dresser so that when y'all go on to school, she can at least pick them up and take her medicine and have something to drink. I'm not hearing that. As children of God, we got to learn to walk in the authority that God has given us. We got to double down on our principles. Parents, you're in the room. You can't be your children's friend right now. You got to double down, baby. If it's wrong, it's wrong. I don't care what you did. Don't let them tell you you did it. I don't care if I did it. You not going to do it. Because in the time that I did it, it was safe. Children are walking out, out the house, going to the store, having a beef with somebody, and not making it home. Because you looked at them crazy. You can't do what I did. We fought. Didn't nobody jump in it. If you was, they were getting the best of you, they helped you home. That was it. Nobody was coming back at you. You got to double down on your children, the things and the principles of God. I know it's going to be hard because some things we haven't done before. Peter never fished during the day. But when the, at the word of Jesus, it wasn't that the fish knew who Peter was. It wasn't that the fish changed their schedule. It was the word of God that changed the schedule. When Jesus said, do it, they had to obey. The word of God arrested those fish and had them wait on Peter. So when God gives you a word, the word that you're getting here, this is hollow ground. I know the sacrifices that have been made so that when you enter in, you meet the presence of God. I know the sacrifices that are, be, that are being made so that when you get a word, it's a word that you can live by. It is a relevant word. It's not something that's pretend or made up. It's not something tweaked to make you feel good. It's the unadulterated word of God. It's what the Bible says. I know the sacrifices that have been made for that. So when you come in here, this is an anointed place. And the message that you get here, if you would take it out into the world, you will be victorious. I'm not saying it's not going to be hard, but you will be victorious. You will come out the better. You will come out and be the head and not the tail. You will wind up being the lender and not the bar borrower. But it's the principles that you got to apply. Peter had to do what the word said. 
when Jesus said go out, he had to move at that. Move at that word. Hold that word true. Be, be about that word. It's, 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 it was customary for them to fish at night for several reasons. The first reason was to avoid the heat of the day. Just like they wanted to stay cool, the fish wanted to stay cool. So they weren't coming to the surface. They were staying underneath the surface during that time of day. The other one is certain species of fish were just active at night. You know how some of us are. I'm a night person. I'd be up all night long. I, you know, that's just the thing. Some of us are more active at night than we are at day. The fish were the same way. And so when the boats would come through at night with the lights, they would know what's going on up there. And they could catch more of the fish. The third reason was that the materials that their nets were made out of was linen. Back in the day, they didn't have a whole lot of plastic and all the stuff that we see around. They had linen. And the, um, during the day, the fish could see the nets better. So at night, they go out and the fish couldn't quite see the nets as well. Therefore, they were captured. So my note to that, lurking in the shadows or functioning in the dark or being absent from the light can get you caught up. If you are functioning in the, in the dark, that's a place where you can't see very well. If you're maneuvering on limited knowledge, that's functioning in the dark. You could get hurt, or better yet, you could cause hurt. When you function with limited knowledge and you stay in a dark place and you're not getting a place where you can receive the light of the Holy Spirit, where you can receive the word of God, you do things that you think are okay, but they can potentially harm you and most likely will hurt somebody else. You say, it's just me, that's just how I am, but you cuss everybody out in your presence, even those that take care of you, even those that have been nice to you. You live in their house and you act a total fool. Well, that's just me, that's just how I am. You in the dark, baby. You need to come to the light because that's hurting you. And moreover, it's hurting the person that will take care of you. It's hurting the person that will be in your corner. Right now, some people don't have people on their side because you don't wore them out. Good people get tired of being good people. And a lot of times, they stay good people because of the Holy Ghost. They stay good that long because of Jesus. That is the only reason you haven't been laid to rest. So we got to learn how to stay in the light. We got to learn to bring our family, our friends to the light. So it's up to you to spread the word of God and be the word of God. Young people, your integrity is everything. Your integrity is everything. They said word is bond. The Bible said it a long time ago that your mouth speaks life and death. Your tongue speaks life and death. Your word is bun. That's good. That's the street. But the word of God told you that. Be about your word. I heard T.D. Jakes say, everybody said, young, young people said, we keep it 100. Nobody keeps it 100. All of us keep something. All of us keep something. He said to the, to the men, if your wife asked you how her butt looked in the dress and you said it looked like two polar bears wrestling under the sheets, that wouldn't be good. So you got to keep that. So nobody keeps it 100. He said, ladies, if, if your man asks you, am I a good lover? And you said, well, you, you up in the top 10. That wouldn't be good. Some stuff ain't worth saying. You won't be keeping it 100. He said you'll be keeping it in divorce court. Because some stuff you just don't say. So nobody ever keeps it 100. The only person that keeps it 100 is God Almighty. But you do your best to keep your word and it be good. If you can't do it, just say you can't do it. But don't say you can do it and then don't do it. If you borrow it, return it. If you said, let me hold $5 till Friday, come Friday, don't let nobody be looking for you. Take them their $5. I don't care if it's in nickels and dimes. Even if you got to take it to them and say, 
can I, I'm going to need this back for another week. Be about your word. It's imperative. As the body of Christ, we are walking in favor in this society. We got jobs because we in the body of Christ. It's by the grace of God that you still got a job. Companies are closing down. Businesses are shutting down. I drive all 48 states, and I see more empty places than a little bit. I go to places where I got to sit eight and nine hours because they're short staffed and cannot load the truck. People don't want to work, and the jobs that's out there is few and far between. But you got a job. You in school. You got a roof over your head. You driving a car. I don't care if it's a bucket with four boats and three wheels. And you on a donut. You driving. You riding a bike. Whatever it is. The body of Christ is living in favor. Under grace. Like never before. You got to double down. If you're not meditating in the morning, turning on some gospel music, young people, I know, listen to what you listen to. But at night, turn that off. Your ear gates, your, your, your ear gates are still open. Your mind is still going. Put some gospel music on or, or, or scripture or nothing. But all that other stuff, you don't want that running through your system 24-7. You need something stronger than that. It sounds good, it's cute. I like RB, I like hip hop and all that stuff too. But it's a limit. What you feed the most is what would be the strongest. And it really doesn't cost you anything. If you really think about it, you really think about it. What does it cost you to be honest? What does it cost you for somebody to trust you? What does it cost you to be a person that they know is about their word? They know going to do what they said. Nothing. Because even if you're not going to do it, you tell them no, guess what? They be like, she going to tell you the truth. It doesn't cost you anything. Double down. So, let me get back to my, because I done got all off subject. Um, as a result, we st if we would be still and listen to the word, and wait on the Lord, our situations will change. It is the word of God that changes those situations. It is the word of God that makes um, circumstances alter. It is the word of God that opens doors. It is the word of God that gives you self-assurance. Even when you don't feel like, I have wrestled with anxiety, and a lot of people don't know that because my personality doesn't say that. My personality doesn't say that. My character doesn't say that. But I've wrestled with, uh, with anxiety and insecurities. You know what sustained me? The word of God. When I just felt like I wanted to snap and choke everybody around me? The word of God. Those of you that are getting to know me, those that know me, know me, because I'm just going to tell you. But those of you getting to know me, what you see is what you get. And so there are times where I have felt that way, but it's the word of God. If you do not feed that, you are not able to manage that. All right? If you don't know anything about it, that's like hopping on a system at work or a new software, and you're trying to work it, and you don't know anything about it. You didn't go to no training. You, you, you don't know how to function in there. You can't manage that software because you don't know anything about it. You can't manage your spiritual man if you don't know anything about it. And the best way to know something about it is to go to the manufacturer. Go to the creator and get the information. Then you'll be able to manage those feelings, those emotions, and all the things that go, go with it. Um, so when the circumstances come up, we learn how to manage them. We apply this knowledge to our life, and we'll see the changes uh, in our circumstances. Does it sound familiar when you have a job application? You know you're not qualified, but you have heard the word of God said, fill out the application. 
and you get the job. Does it sound familiar when you need to go back to school and you hear God say, go back to school, but you say, I don't have a babysitter. But some way, somehow, something works out because you did what the word of God said. Have you ever heard the word of God tell you to sow a seed and you be like, God, my bank account is negative. But you sow the seed and you get a check in the mail. Somebody hand you a little round. Then the mothers of the church bad about hanging a little round hand. You know, you open it up and it's just what you need to put some gas in the car. Because the word of God will never fail you. It may not come when you want it. But it'll be right on time. Double down. Double down. Take the risk. Partake in your life. When you double down and you're taking a risk, you're now partaking in your own life. When you're just cruising along, you're just going with the status quo, that's not your life. You're going with the status quo that's been set for you. Double down. Take the chances. Trust God. Let God, let God give you the instructions. Let God lead the way. He'll give you the energy. He'll give you the resources. He'll send you to the people. He'll tell you where to go. He'll tell you what to do. Lord, we need a word from you. If we don't hear from you, we don't know what to do. Father, send your word. The Bible says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. One word from God can change your whole situation. One word. You want to listen for the word of God. If you have not gotten to a place where you hear him easily and you don't know, that means you need to meditate on being quiet and being still. Because the word of God is not just a whisper in your ear. It is a feeling. Most of the time, you have heard the word of God. When he said, don't go there. Phone ring, you look down. And you go, mm, that's the word of God. You knew you were, don't answer that. As a matter of fact, that probably needs to be a block call. Because the word of God, you want to hear an audible sound. The word of God is a feeling. You'll know. That old, older people say, you'll know that you know. It's that gut feeling. We said, something told me the word of God. I had a feeling that I shouldn't have went that way. The word of God, you got to learn to tune into that. Learn to make sure that you feel that, that you know that, that you hear that. For the next phase in your life, what you have done is not enough. You have to do more work. You got to do more studying. You're going to have to pray more. You're going to have to fast sometime. You got to fast sometime. You're going to have to fast sometime. The Bible says some things only come by fasting sometime. I promise you, you don't want to do it, but you want that breakthrough. You need to double down. You want your situation to change? You need to double down. You need to learn to create the presence of God. Me coming in here hollering today is not what I did for y'all. I did that for me. That's what I do all the time. Because sometimes you need to learn to set the atmosphere for you. You work in a hostile environment. You need to learn how to set the atmosphere for you. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. You in a combative relationship, you're going to have to work that out, but you got to learn to set the, relation, set the atmosphere for you. You can do more and go further when you learn how to set the atmosphere. You got to be extreme. You got to be radical. I don't care if God said and you totally don't understand it. You know it's God, you need to obey it. I don't care how crazy it sounds. I don't care how wacky it is. I don't care how out of order it is. I don't care how extreme it is, upside down, right side up, inside out, or backwards. If God said for you to do it, you need to obey. 
Ask Abraham. Wife couldn't have no children. They messed up, had one that she wasn't hers. She messed around and had one, and God tells him to sacrifice that one. Now, that ain't backwards. But God told him to do it. And because God told him to do it, and he obeyed, you see the outcome. He's the father of many nations. God provided. He didn't have to say, and, 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 and I think what God was saying, now I know. You being here laying out on the floor, snotting, crying, praying, and asking God to do all the things, but he don't know if you really trust him. You're in an emotional state. You're excited, but you don't want to tarry. That's an old-fashioned word. You don't want to fast. Abraham did what God asked him to do, was going to sacrifice his only son, as the Bible calls him. Even though he had another son, he said his only son. He was willing to sacrifice the son that he waited on. And when he was willing to do what God said, God could say, now I know. I know you're serious, Adam. Now I know you really want from me what you've been asking me for. Now I know I can trust you. Now I know that you'll handle my business and won't be uh, 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 dipping in the money. I'm going to talk about it. You <laughs> dipping in the money. You want to bless you financially, but you're dipping in the money. You won't do your part. You're asking God for all this stuff. He said, I just asked you for a little bit. I just need to know if you're really serious. He told Abraham, now I know. So no matter what the word of God says, go all out. It could be crazy, but God will provide. I hear the Lord saying, it's time. It's time. It's time for you to stop playing. It's time for you to stop pretending. It's time for you to stop faking. It's time for you to drop some bad habits. It's time for you to let some people go. It's time for you to change your phone number. It's time for you to shut your mouth. It's time for you to seek his face. It's time for you to meditate on the word of God. It's time for you to write the vision. It's time for you to sacrifice for your household. It's time for you to trust the process. It's time for you to stop whining and to stop complaining. It's time for you to praise the Lord like you've never done before. It's time for you to come out of the closet and let the world know that you are a child of the most high God. It's time for you to double down. Come on, give God a hand, proper place. If you're here today and you just want to pray about doubling down, you can come to the altar. We just want to give God some glory. We want to give God uh, the honor that he is due. If you know that you want to make some changes, you want to be greater than where you are, you want to go farther than where you've been, you can come to the altar and we'll agree together that God will give you the insight. He will give you the word. He will give you the wisdom. He will give you the courage because it takes courage. We don't just wake up and be, have courage to uh, change our life. That's a major undertaking. We don't wake up and have the courage to change our behavior. That's a major undertaking. And we can't do it unless God helps us. So if that's you today, you can come to the altar. And we're going to close out in prayer as the praise team comes.